faith in you, Lord. And may you wash all their sins away, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for repentance in Christ Jesus. And him alone, Lord, is our salvation. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're glad you're here today, and I know you're glad to be here as well. There we go. All right. <laughs> and uh, we're so glad that you are. Today, you're in for a treat. If you are visiting, uh, it's an exciting time because we are starting our missions emphasis. You say, I don't really know what that is. Well, you'll find out, which is great. Truth is, our church loves uh, missions, and uh, we love missionaries, and uh, we believe it's an important thing. I actually believe the Bible teaches that missions is really the heartbeat of God. And so throughout the year, you're going to hear missionaries, you're going to uh, be exposed to missionaries, but for the next three Sundays, uh, you're going to have an opportunity to kind of be involved in missions. You're going to hear some things today, next Sunday, Brother James mentioned the festival, and the look, uh, a lot of you are from a lot of different places, and you could represent your home, your country, and I want to encourage you to do that. And you would do it far better than I would do it. And so we, next week at noon, we all go downstairs, and there's tables set up. You come at 11, and you can set some things up. You could come to the early service. But uh, our Spanish church, our Bangla church, and our English church is going to be a part. We go downstairs, and it's always great. There's food. Uh, there's some stats, some statistics, some photos. And the whole purpose is to give a visual to a, a reminder that there are a whole lot of people around the world, 8.1 billion of them, that need to hear about Christ. And so if you'd be willing to help us, you have questions, talk to Brother James about that. You can still sign up. That's next week. We have one of our missionaries uh, from France that's going to be with us a few weeks after that. You're going to get some new updated missionary prayer cards. We're going to ask you to pray in a few months. We're going to do an Adopt-A-Missionary program in October. We do some other missions things because missions is important. Our theme this year is go. Um, go. Uh, sometimes when you hear that word, it's a good thing, and sometimes it's a bad thing. When I was a kid in school and the teacher said, it's 3.30, it's time to go, I was the first one up and out the door. You know what I mean? Go meant a good, good thing. Uh, sometimes when you hear somebody say go, it's not in a positive context. Well, when Jesus tells us to go and to tell people about him, it's a good thing. And uh, we're going to speak about that a little bit today and over the next few weeks. We want each person to evaluate and be challenged. What can I do to help the good news of the gospel to go out? And so uh, it's important. We're going to uh, show you that right now what our church does, what you do to help get the gospel around the world is, is great. We partner with 33 missionaries here in the city and around the world and so we, we made a video about a year ago. There's some new faces that can be added. There's a couple that have retired. But this will give you kind of a little bit of a summary of the missionaries right now that we partner with around the world. Let's watch that.
great. We have 33 missionary families, and um, look, we've had missionaries that have had to come back. Um, we have missionaries in New York right now. We, we do partner with a lot of uh, church planners here, Arabic, Chinese, uh, different boroughs, uh, Hispanic. We've had missionaries that have had to come back because they got kicked out of the countries where they were. Um, and so instead of doing nothing, they're, they're here in New York reaching those same people groups. We've had missionaries that have grown older and have had to retire, uh, some in Central America, Nicaragua, um, um, and then uh, Canada. We've had missionaries in Moldova and Romania that have retired. Um, we've got uh, missionaries in Africa as well. So we need to continue to replace. And so um, there's a big wide world out there. So I show you this to know that we're making an effort. There's so much more we can do, but to try to reach people around the world. And when we partner with these missionaries, what we're doing is we're partnering with them in prayer. And uh, we'll talk a lot about that. But there are missionary prayer cards. You'll have new ones here in two weeks, updated. But there's still some out there. And you can pray and pray for your missionaries. Pray for them. And every week we try to have a missionary of the week. Um, we partner with them in prayer as they're there. Uh, doing God's, God's work, building God's kingdom. And then we give. Uh, every month our church is committed to giving something to their livelihood. And so when you pick up your envelope and it says missions and you put money toward that, it goes to them. It doesn't pay the light bills here. It doesn't do anything here. It goes to our 33 missionary families because most of them cannot work a job where they live in those places. They, they're not allowed to do that. And so they rely on churches and Christians here to keep them there so that they can do the work. Um, and it's going toward church buildings and Bibles and all kind of things. So, and then uh, you can be a part. Over the years, we've taken mission trips, Nicaragua, Puerto Rico. We've done a lot of South. We've been into Canada. This year, our young adults are going in August to Guyana to work with Greg and Wendy Mann. They're going way out in the, in the, in the jungle area. And so we're going to ask the church to pray and to help and to give toward that. We're going to try to take some other trips, um, and we've been out west and helped uh, the DeFords who are working on a Native American Indian reservation there. So uh, there are things that we can do, and I want to encourage you, and we'll talk more about it, but it's our responsibility to do that. We asked all of our missionaries, if they would and if they could, to send us a quick video, and uh, we want to show you one today. Ray Hoover is maybe uh, now, I don't know if he's our uh, eldest, but he's up there. He and Wanda are in their 70s, and you'll hear him say they're in Ethiopia. They've been there 20 years, and before that, they were 14 or 15 years in the Mediterranean island of Malta, started four churches in Malta, and then they were there uh, for 15 years. Before that, he pastored here in the U.S. for 15 to 20 years, and so um, you'll hear him uh, today just talk about some of the things God is doing. We have partnered with the Hoovers for a long time, over 30 years. And so I want you to just give a listen. He gave us a quick update today. Good morning, Pastor Dan and All Nations Baptist Church. This Brother Hoover. Glad to see all of you. God bless you. And uh, thank you so much for your faithful support from me and Wanda for all of these years. Congratulations on your missions month, which starts tomorrow. And I hope and pray that it is a great blessing. And uh, be faithful. And uh, may your pastors and different ones that you invite preach the word of God. And may your hearts just be full and overflowing. God bless you guys so much. The, let me give you a, a short report about what's going on on the field. Uh, Wanda and I are celebrating our 20th year in Ethiopia. Isn't that great? 20 years. And uh, preacher, I'm ready to re-enlist again and uh, start all over. So uh, thing, a lot of good things are happening. Let me tell you about the last month. Within the last month, we've had almost 30 people accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, I believe over 24 or 25 of them have been baptized, and we have another new church getting started, uh, a new church being started by a new church. So we have a church that's about two years old. It's one of our newest ones. They are doing great, running around 100 or so uh, on Sundays and uh, just doing a great job. Lots of people have been saved at that church it's way out in the countryside, 
maybe around four or five hours from Otis. And uh, wow, we have an evangelist there by the name of Bekele. Bekele is a farmer, but oh, he's doing a great job winning people to Christ, learning, being mentored. And uh, some of our other evangelists are training him. And then Brother Teddy and Brother Lombi are going out there. Uh, in fact, they just came back and uh, seeing that new church that's going to be started, oh, what a blessing. Uh, I'll show you in the video some of the things that have been going on, uh, souls being saved, people being baptized. It's a nice uh, video, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Once again, uh, congratulations for what God is going to do for your missions conference this year. I know he's going to bless you guys. Pastor Dan, thank you for being a faithful pastor, faithful missionary. All nations, thank you for being a faithful congregation. May the Lord bless you guys just very, very well. Uh, may he just pour out his blessings upon you. Open your hearts, open your minds, open your souls, and uh, let God fill you up. And uh, that's my prayer for you guys. Thank you again for all you've done for us. Please pray for us. We've got some exciting things going on. I'm looking forward to the next few years. Oh, my. I, I, I wish I had another 20 or 30 years on the field. But God is doing great things. And it's because of the churches. His video cut out after that. But, yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> When you, and when you hear guys like that say they wish they had another 20 or 30 years, I know it's uh, very um, um, prescient on their heart and minds about who's coming in after me. And uh, so they're training men in Ethiopia to start churches and start churches, but um, the laborers are always few. Yep. And uh, here, here's a couple. They have some health issues, so if you pray for the Hoovers regarding that, uh, there's a possibility that they'll be able to come and visit us in person in April. Uh, we're working on that. But um, he's been here many times, and um, I, I'm just thankful for faithfulness. Faithfulness counts for a lot. So be praying for the Hoovers. Pray for our missionaries. Uh, you're going to meet a new family in a couple of weeks as well. Get involved in the festival. It's an exciting time. And uh, I hope that today... You will start, and over the next few weeks, think about what am I doing and what can I do, what should I be doing to help the gospel go around the world. Uh, we're going to dismiss the teens to go, and uh, the rest of us, let's talk about that today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, and, um, and we're going to speak about that today. What am I doing? What can I do to get the gospel around the world? And it's so important um, that we think that way. Let's do this. Let's, let's pray. Let's pray for the Hoovers. Can we do that today? Lord, thank you for just the opportunity to open your word. Thank you for uh, men and women who say, hear my Lord, and uh, that are willing to respond to the call. Lord, we know we need to all be willing. I pray, Lord, that you would just help us over the course of today and the next several weeks just to ask ourselves these questions. What are we doing to uh, help those who have gone? What are we doing to get the gospel around the world? And so, Lord, I pray for, the, for us to be honest about that. I pray that if there's anybody here today that does not know you as his or her Savior, that today would be the day they'd realize the gospel is available that today could be the day that uh, he or she puts their trust in you. And their life has changed forever, and I pray they'll make that decision. And Lord, I, I pray for the Hoovers in a special way. And Lord, uh, they've been battling health issues, but yet they continue. They, they continue on in, in, a, in a country that, uh, Lord, has uh, neighbors who are in conflict for sure, a country that is threatening all the time to really... Uh, put intense pressure on those who are teaching or preaching anything other than the orthodox uh, faith. And Lord, I, I just pray you'll protect them. I pray you'll provide for them. 
what good news to hear these churches growing and men and women who are stepping in and uh, doing all they can to reach their own people. So I pray you'd bless the Hoovers in a special way and uh, Lord, let them know they're loved and uh, thank you for the small privilege we have to partner with them. And so Lord, I just pray you'll bless over the next few weeks as we think about our responsibility to go. And God will thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in the late 1700s, a fictional book was written by a man named Jules Verne. And the book was entitled Around the World in 80 Days. You ever heard of that book? Maybe you had to read it in school. Completely fictional. I know they made television shows and series and movies and all those things about this book. And basically the idea, the plot was that uh, a, a wager was made between a man and a uh, and really a newspaper company in England, and, or in France, and I'm sorry, in England, and the newspaper uh, had essentially said it's impossible to travel around the world in 80 days, and uh, they put out a wager. So this man who lived a nominal day-to-day, same old, same old kind of life, took the, the gamble and said, I can do it, I believe I can do it, I can get around the world in 80 days. And so the wager was in today's economy a little over a million dollars. And so when you read through the book, you realize that there were turmoil and trouble and roadblocks and obstacles. But at the end of it all, he made it in 80 days. And it became a best-selling book. What's interesting is that after the book was written, real-life people began to think about this concept. And they decided that they were going to take on this personal endeavor themselves. So in 1889, two women uh, working on their, in their own power decided that they were going to attempt to make it around the world in 80 days. And so they did. Uh, one of them failed miserably. The other actually completed everything that the book had described. She made it around the world and she did it in 72 days. She went on to write her own memoir, a book on how I went around the world in 72 days, which also became a bestseller. Uh, People continued on, especially in the late 1800s, different people breaking this record. Uh, Some uh, in 54 days, one man did it in 1903. A young boy from Denmark in 1928 did it in 44 days. And so again, when you think about some of these things prior to planes, prior to some of the transportation modes that we have today. The most recent was in 2017, when a British cyclist decided he would take the uh, details from the book and he would apply it to cycling. And he determined to try to cycle around the world in 80 days. He completed his trip in 78 days, 14 hours, and 40 minutes. And he uh, crossed the globe some 18 thousand miles on a bike some of you like to ride bikes some of you are good at bikes i would not want to ride a bike for eighteen thousand miles now i think about that and i think all these people took a fictional character from a fictional story and they allowed it to influence their life to now go and do something tangible to try to break this record for notoriety for fame for their own uh, accomplishment sake And and I was thinking about that this week, and I thought, how great would it be if we as Christians who have something greater than our acclaim and our fame and, and, and our achievement, but we actually have a message that is worth proclaiming around the world, if we actually got serious and said, let's do everything we can to get the gospel message of Jesus Christ around the world in 80 days, could we do it? Could we do it? You especially think today... With all the technology and everything that is at our our disposal, you would think it could be possible. But you understand there are still literally people groups in the world who have never even heard the name Jesus mentioned. You understand there are people, we meet people in New York City that when you begin to talk to them about Jesus, they have no idea who you're talking about. They've not one time heard about who Jesus is, much less They've even heard about the fact that he left heaven and came to earth to die for them. 
And you, and you understand that what we have in our possession is a message that we're not to sit on, but we're to proclaim. And I want you to see here in Mark chapter 16, you know this verse really well, verse 15. Here's what Jesus said in Mark 16, 15. He says to his disciples, go ye into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. So here's Jesus' command to his disciples to go. In essence, he is saying you need to get up and you need to move. You need to, to travel. You need to, 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 to be displaced from where you are. And, and he says, go you. I want you to see that's personal. It's not just like, yeah, yeah, you know, go religious leaders and go pastor and Bible teachers. If you know Christ as Savior, this is a command for you, for me. Go ye. Jesus chose to use the church to be the method by which the gospel is supposed to go throughout the world. He chose not to use the government to do that, not to use a better education system. It's not in uh, the finance world. It's through the church. The church is supposed to go. And who's the church? You, you, you and me. So he says, you're to go. That, that's, that's, the, that's what you're supposed to do. And, and, and it's personal. You, are you going? Now, we're going we're to talk about that a little bit. Are you making a move to do something to help the good news to go out all across the world? That's the question. He says, go into all the world. That's the parameters. And I want you to think about that. We say this often, but you and I should understand it is our responsibility to share the gospel. And definitely we are to do that with people that we're close with. Family, living in our same house, our neighbors. We say this all the time. You know people that I will never meet, and I know people you will never meet. And one day, God's going to say, look, I had those people living in the apartment next to you for 10 years, and you never one time tried to talk to them about me. Or, hey, I've had these people living in this house on the end of your street, and you would say hello, and you'd see them. They lived there for years, but did you ever share the gospel with them? And we're going to be accountable for that. But I want you to broaden the way you think. Jesus says that we're to go into all the world. You and I are accountable for our efforts to try to get the gospel to other places in the world. Some of you are products and byproducts of people making an intentional effort of trying to get the gospel to other places in the world. And I've heard so many of your testimonies, some of you who you didn't grow up here in the States, but you, you, you heard the gospel because of churches or ministries that were started by missionaries way, 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 way back. People who intentionally took the, the call and, and, and the command seriously, and they went. And as a result, you're here today. As a result... We've all been able to hear. We're sitting in a church building today that people had, had a burden and had a calling and they sacrificed and they prayed and they gave to build a building here in 1896 so that this community could hear the gospel. All of us have been influenced by people who took seriously this commission to go into all the world and then to what? To preach the gospel and to do it to every creature. A creature, he's not talking about animals. We know animals, they don't have that spirit. Jesus didn't die for the animal kingdom. But he's talking about every person who has breath. Every man and woman, boy or girl, is made in the image of God. And we have that soul and spirit with, with which we can communicate with God. And Jesus died for every person, doesn't matter how old, how young, what they look like, where they came from, what language they speak. Those are the people. Jesus said, that's the parameter, the entire world. And we need to preach the gospel. Preach, that's an interesting word. The gospel <clears throat> is used 99 times in the Bible. The word euangelion means good news. Good news. Most of us like to receive good news. 
The gospel is what? People talk about different things. Well, that's the gospel. What is the gospel? Paul's really clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verses 3 and 4. He said, here's what the gospel is, Corinth. I delivered you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That, that's part one. And then he was buried, and then he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. He said that he would do that, and he did that. And he was then seen of people. So what is this gospel? Is it that, hey, if you, if you try hard enough, you'll, you'll be a good person? Or, hey, what goes around comes around. Hey, it's great to try hard. It's good to do good things. But that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that we were sinners, but God so loved us, Jesus came, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, but the story didn't end. He arose. And because he lives, we can live also. Amen? Amen. And if you weren't sure he actually rose... They documented people. Cephas saw him, and 500 people once saw him, and James's brothers saw him, and oh, yeah, Paul said, by the way, I saw him. And so that's the good news, that there is one who can destroy death and the fear of death and the penalty of death and the power of sin, and he did. He died for us. He put to death death and lives forever, and now he can offer me life forever. He is the resurrection and the life. That's the good news. And do you understand there are people who've never even heard that? And so we are told to go forth and tell people, are we doing that? And by the way, I get it. You know, I try to live Jesus and I try to be a good person. And that's fantastic. Because quite frankly, if you're not living a life that reflects Christ, it's really hard to open your mouth and talk about Christ. Because then you get those monikers like you're nothing but a raven hypocrite. And, you know, you got to practice what you preach. And actions speak louder than words. But make no mistake, at some point, we do have to speak. You do, you do have to share. Are you doing that? I mean, it's not just enough. You know, if, if, if those of you who were married, if when you were dating your wife or your husband, if you just kind of like, you know, hung around all the time and giggled and laughed and, you know, did all the the things, but you never came out and finally said, hey, I like you. Hey, I love you. Hey, will you marry me? If you just stay silent and just, you know, body language is enough, and that's never going to work. They're going to go another way. And at some point, they would say, why didn't you just say something? And it's when both are working together. And so, yes, live Jesus, but there will be a time and a place when you got to open your mouth and Tell people about Christ, because that's what he has asked of us to do. There is no other message in the whole wide world that will change people like the gospel. Paul wrote it this way, Romans 1 and verse 15 and 16. So here's what he said. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to those of you who are at Rome also. In essence, he said, as much as I possibly can, I am ready to just preach Jesus to people. Do you have that thought that goes through your mind every day? I'll be honest with you, I don't. I'd like to say every morning when I get up and I pray that that's one of my prayers. God, to the best of my ability, the most energy I have, to the most focus that I possibly can, everywhere I go today, let me be preaching Jesus. Now, I may have that desire in my heart, But you know how life is. We get distracted. We get busy. Things are happening. And days go by. And people go by. And we're not even thinking about their eternal souls. We're not even thinking about where are they spiritually. I mean, we're just just trying to grind out the day. You know, we're just trying to make what we got to make and do what we got to do to survive. And meanwhile, what's most important to God, this kingdom, we're 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 not even doing anything to contribute or to try to reach other people with the gospel of Christ. Here, in, you find, he, Paul would say, look, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation. If you are here today, and you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then here's what you should absolutely know, that your life has been changed by Jesus. Can you say that today? 
Now, if you're like, eh, I'm, I'm pretty much the same, it's no big deal, then you need to check your relationship with the Lord. But Paul said, you know why I'm so fervent while I'm all in? You want to know why I'm all in on telling people about Jesus? Because I know what he did for me. Do you remember what Jesus did for you? Do you remember who you were before you had this relationship with him? Or have you forgotten? Or has life just kind of dumped everything on top of you and your relationship and your memories of, of what Jesus has done? It's just kind of buried because you're overwhelmed with everything else going on in life. And that's a sad place to be. All of us would do well to remember and to remember and to remember every day what Jesus Christ has done for us. It would change the way we live. It would change our, our, our attitude. It would change our outlook on things. And Paul said, I don't forget what Jesus did. Super religious, but as lost as the devil himself. I was persecuting Christians, and Jesus saved me and changed me. He made me a different person. And I know what this gospel can do. And so I'm going to tell everybody that I can. I don't care if they're Jewish. I don't care if they're Gentile. I don't care if they say they're atheists. I don't care if they say they're super religious. I don't care if they're old. I don't care if they're young. I don't care if they're intelligent. I don't care if they're not intelligent. They need to hear about Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can change their life. And that is true today. You know, the one The one person who can change everything in this world is Jesus Christ. Everything. There would be no problems, no wars, no international diplomatic uh, diplomatic issues, none of that if the world turned to Jesus Christ. And one day he will come back. There will be true peace in this world. And he will rule. You'll see it. Meanwhile... People don't know him. And how are they going to know him if we don't tell them? He tells us to go. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible says this. If our gospel be hid, then it's hid to them that are lost. If our gospel, what, what, what do you mean? Sometimes we get the, uh, in the mailbox here, we get mail that belongs to other people. And sometimes, you know, they'll put it on my desk, and right away, I, I don't look at the name of the receiver. I just see, you know, the big le- uh, on, the, on the mail, like where it came from. You know, bank, and I'm like, what is this about? And, I, and a couple times I've opened it, I've learned, oh, I can't do that. I need to look at the name. And then when I say, that's not ours. I don't have a problem with the Department of Buildings. I don't have a problem with uh, the tax assessor. I don't have a bank issues because this is not my mail. That's not my problem. You know, a lot of Christians live kind of like Africa is not my problem. India is really not my problem. South America, eh, that's not my problem. When it comes to the gospel, can I say this reverently? It is your problem. It is my problem. Paul said, this is our gospel. How are people in South America going to hear about Jesus if people who know about Jesus don't tell them? How are people in China going to hear about Christ if people who know about Christ aren't at least trying to find some way to help people or to point people to Christ that live there? By the way, we understand, and some of you, this is your life experience. But by the grace of God, some of us could be in some of these countries where we we are not allowed to hear about Christ, where it is really forced conversion into a religion or off with your head. We have missionaries in some of those countries. We can't mention their names. We can't put their pictures on a screen if they're ever seen because countries where they live scour the internet looking and if they ever find out, their lives are in jeopardy. But can I say to you, we have a responsibility. So what are we doing? Are we praying for people in these countries? Are we trying to get behind people that will say, I'll go to that. Oh, God bless you. Let me help you as much as I can. Or would we even dare say, hey, I'll go if you want me to do that. 
we say this all the time, missionaries don't come from some factory. They come from churches. We've had people from our church who have left our church, and they're out. Miss Aida, when she retired, left New York and went back to her home country, and they've been there for years serving the Lord. She's 92 now. Howard Rothenberg was saved right in Manhattan, Jews for Jesus, witnesses, Jewish man, and he, 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 he opened his heart and he became a believer. He's in South Florida. He's working in a big Jewish community, Bible studies every day, eight or nine a week. We've got, I think about Brother Guy Paradin, who was a product and came through. I think about Brother John Gibson, who was reached out on a street corner in, in Elmhurst, Queens, one of our ladies gave him a track, and he came to church, and he got saved that night. We have many families who've been members of our church, who've gone back to their home countries, and now they're playing the piano in churches. They're teaching Bible classes. They're helping pastors and missionaries. That's great. Would I be willing to do that? Can I say to you, I know, I, I can't do that. My life's here. I can't go and what, what have you, and I don't know how I would ever make it. You understand where God l l guides you, he always provides for you? I'll just say this. My wife and I never thought we'd be in New York City. Not in my wildest dreams. You could ask me a hundred times and a hundred times where, you, where I would be. New York City was not going to be on the list. But can I say God blesses? God takes care of us? You're not as mean as people said. Okay, Or maybe now I'm just as mean as you. That's probably what it is, right? We've been here long enough. Hey, what I'm saying is if God puts something in your heart, don't say no to God. Right? And by the way, let me just throw this in. It's not part of the, but it is part of the, parents, look, if God wants your kid to go somewhere and preach the gospel, you need to be a thousand percent behind that. And I have had conversations with parents who have bold-facedly said to me, I am not going to let my kid go to Africa. And I would say to them, then your kid is more in danger staying here in New York City out of God's will than being in Africa in God's will. And you need to understand that. I'd much rather be in the middle of God's will with him on my side. If God be for you, who can be against you? Right? And we've got it all backwards. We need to understand what's important to God. The gospel, that's his heartbeat. That's really what, and we're going to see this here in a minute, that's what really pleases and excites God. That his gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection, that that message gets to the whole world. That's when we're blessed. It's our responsibility. Romans 10, verse 13 through 15. You know this passage. Here's what the scriptures say. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. How many of you are grateful that verse is in the Bible? Amen? Whosoever. It doesn't say, now, if you're really smart, or you're really good looking, okay, or you're really wealthy, because I'd be out in all of those. Okay, but whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, you, nah, you might be saved. That's not what it said. You shall be saved. Verse 14. But how then shall they call on him in whom they haven't believed, and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Hey, if we know that whoever calls on the name of the Lord is going to be saved, what a deal. But how are people going to call upon a Jesus that they don't even know? And how are they going to know about Jesus if somebody doesn't tell them about Jesus? Especially people who know Jesus. Now, I get it, and maybe you're one of those that, well, I found Jesus, I was searching, and I got on the internet, and praise be to God, but I would say to you, God used people in your life to still pour into you and pray for you and speak to you in circumstances. God always uses people. And can you imagine if the people God used in our lives to bring us to him decided, no, thank you, I don't want to be involved? Whether it was a family member or a coworker or a neighbor what if they just said, I'm not going to say anything? Where would we be today? And so Paul says, if people don't know, how are they going to believe? 
and, and how are they going to know if somebody doesn't tell them? And then he would go on to say in verse 15, he would quote from Isaiah, and he would say, and how shall they hear without a preacher? Just somebody who will speak the truth. And how shall they uh, preach except they be sent? As it is written, beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How are they going to hear if somebody doesn't tell them? There are probably certain people that you are excited when they come and see you. My dog gets real excited when the Amazon man comes to our house. That's a, that's a big day for him. He's really excited. Okay? Most of us have people that, oh, man, I'd love to have them over. Yeah, I always love getting together with them. They're, they're, they're funny. They have great stories. We get along great, you know, or, hey, kids get together. It's great, and it's always great. I, anytime. And then there are probably people you're like, nah, I don't need to see those people again, ever. Well, here's what Paul said. You understand that you are one of those people that, that is refreshing, that, that people will rejoice about. If you're a person that brings the gospel and they get saved, he says, as a matter of fact, your feet are beautiful. I've never had anybody tell me my feet were beautiful. But if I'm sharing the gospel in God's eyes and to people who've never heard, thank you for crossing a street and giving me a gospel track. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to just pray for me because you felt like you needed to do that. That meant a lot. Thank you for sharing Jesus with me day after day in the office. Thank you for praying for me for years. Well, you'll be a person who has beautiful feet to those people because you were willing to do something. Lee Robertson, who was a great preacher for many years, said the gospel... It's only good news if it reaches the lost in time. It's a great message, but if they don't hear it, it doesn't help them. Each of us is supposed to go and preach the gospel to other people. You say, why do I need to do that? I want you to look here. Let's look at Mark 16. So let me give you a little bit of backstory, and maybe you're just not still convinced. So I want, I want to challenge you, and I want you to begin, if, if, if you haven't already, start changing the way you think. It is your responsibility. It is my response. Man, I work 60 hours a week, and I got, I got five kids, and I'm working double jobs, or you know, I don't really speak uh, too well in, in, in English, or whatever the case may be. Look, there's a thousand excuses if you want to make them, but here's the thing. If you're willing to do something, God will, God will use you. He'll give you opportunity. And by the way, can I just say this too? That's why the Bible says to grow and to learn and be a student. And you say, I, I want to try to better share. Great. We have classes for that and training times for that. And we've got a group, multiple people that go out all during the week that'll take you with them. And, 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 I, and you can go with me. You can go with any of these other people. And, and we'll show you and demonstrate some things and give you some tips. But can I just say this? If you know Jesus, you have a story to tell. You may not be a great seminarian, but you can just say, can I just tell you something? This is my story, and you may not like it, but man, I was a sinner, and Jesus loved me and died for me, and he changed my life. I once was lost, now I'm found. I once was blind, now I see, and he'll do that for you too. And it's very hard for people to argue with your changed life. You have a story to tell. Now, notice, Jesus was very upset with his disciples here in Mark 16. We're not going to read all the prior verses, but Jesus had died, was buried, and he rose again. And so when the ladies came on that first day of the week to the tomb, they came to bring spices and to check on everything, and he wasn't there. There was an angel there, and the angel said, don't you remember what Jesus said, that he was going to rise from the dead, and he did. And they were like, mind blown. And the... Bible says that the angel says, go and tell people, but they didn't do that. They, they were just like, people are going to think we're crazy, and I don't know what to think, and maybe I'm losing my mind. But then we read that Jesus meets Mary Magdalene, the woman who had been demon-possessed, and he cast the demons out, and her life was changed, and he sees her in the garden, and she knows who he is, and, and, and she can't believe it. He said, now, Mary, go back and tell all my disciples I'm alive, just like I said. She runs back, guys, guys, you're never going to believe this. And they said, be quiet. You're, you're a fool. 
I don't know what, you, what game you're playing here, and that's, that's not funny. And they would not believe. And then Jesus meets two, a couple, on the road to Emmaus. In the Gospel of Luke, you read all the details, but here it's mentioned. And they don't know who they're talking to until he opens their eyes. Now, that, was, that, was, that was Jesus. And they run back to the disciples. You'll never, you'll never guess who we met. Jesus is alive. And again, the disciples, they're so caught up in their own misery, anxiety. What's going to happen to us now? We're so afraid. How could Jesus do this to us? Our whole worldview is, is being destroyed all about themselves. And they won't believe. So what happens? Jesus shows up. Verse 14. The Bible says this. So afterward, Jesus appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat. They're eating dinner. And guess who shows up? Jesus. And he abraded them. What in the world does that mean? Here's what that means. He rebuked them. You guys are feeling sorry for yourselves. You're not doing what you should be doing. You're with me three and a half years. You hear me teach. You hear me preach. You hear me talk about the kingdom of God. You, you hear me say, seek first God's kingdom. Don't worry about money. Don't worry about all these other things. It just, just, it's all about the kingdom of God. And now you're hiding out. Now you're worried. What is wrong with you? And by the way, he rebukes them because of their doubt, their unbelief. They were disobedient. If your faith and my faith is not what it needs to be, it always produces disobedience. We won't move forward. And if we get caught up, the last five weeks we've been speaking about this culture as opposed to the kingdom of God. And we get all wrapped up with what's going on here and our minds consumed and all of a sudden we become the center of everything and God gets pushed off somewhere there. And what happens? Because God's distant, he's not involved, we're not, we're not really pursuing him like we should, we're not obedient. And that translates into the fact we're not really expanding the kingdom of God. We're not sharing him with people. And Jesus said, you're hard-hearted, you've lost sight of the goal, and you would not believe. And that's when he said in verse 15, go now. And do what? He said, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And then he looks at these 11 guys. These were the apostles. They were going to be the, the church's founding fathers. Special unction on them. So there are no new apostles today. I'm not an apostle, Dan Schaefer. Nobody else is becoming an apostle. Those were the original disciples. And God said to them, because you're going to start this thing, and you're going to be the ones that help bring this church thing into existence, he says, look, you're going to be able to, verse 17, cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, Drink some deadly thing, and it won't hurt you. You'll be able to lay hands on the sick, and, and they'll recover. So please, don't misunderstand. Don't go out and grab some serpent and let it bite you and say, Jesus, maybe you're not an apostle. Okay? All right? And the guy's walking around like, woo, I just hit you. You be healed. It's never going to happen. Okay? This was for a temporary time. Remember, when the church was born... God said, I'm going to make it be so radical that the world, the Jews who always required a sign would see, wow, this must be for real. Remember, Jesus, when he came the first time, said, I'm going to do things so radical and supernatural that they have to recognize that it is I, the Messiah. I'm going to be born of a virgin. So now this thing that he talked about and said was coming, the church, they're going to know it's here. Because I'm going to give my leaders uh, some supernatural power, and it's going to be, wow, amazing. And by the way, one day the church will end in an amazing way, because we'll be walking along, and then boom, we'll be taken out. We'll know the church is gone. So he's telling these guys, I'm with you. If you go out and do what I've asked, I've got your back. And notice, right after verse 19, the Lord had spoken. He was received up into heaven. Boom, he ascended. 
sat down on the right hand of God. And what did they do? They stopped feeling sorry for themselves. They stopped worrying and, and getting consumed with everything going on. The Bible says in verse 20, they went forth and they preached everywhere. You understand that you and I are in this church today because these 11 guys took Jesus' command to go and preach. They took it seriously. Had they not gone out and began to spread the word some 2,000 plus years later, you and I wouldn't be sitting here in a church today in New York City with the opportunity to hear the gospel. Who knows what we'd be doing? Be bowing down, worshiping buildings and all kind of stuff. But these guys took this commission seriously. If you know Jesus, do you take it seriously to go forth? You do. You know why? Because it's God's plan. It's always been God's plan. 1 Peter 1, 18. Let me just give you a couple of thoughts. Bible tells us we are not redeemed with corruptible things. Aren't you glad you don't get to heaven because of silver and gold? You don't get to heaven because you're a religious person? No, you get to heaven because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed, verse 19, as of a lamb without spot. Jesus, the Bible says in verse 20, had foreordained before the foundation of the world that this would happen. What do you mean? Before you and I were even created, God had a plan to make man, to make woman, to, to have a great relationship. But God, because of his foreknowledge, knew that when we were given this free will, we would choose to disobey him. He didn't write us off. He also didn't say, I'm going to make a bunch of robots. He, he gave us the free will, and it would hurt him. But guess what? He still loved us. And so he created a plan by which he would come to us he left, he went. Can I get you to think about it? Jesus was the first missionary. He left heaven and came here. Uncomfortable, new culture, took upon him a form of flesh so that he could die for you and for me. And he had that all decided before the world was ever created, which speaks to the love and the goodness and the mercy of God. That was his plan, that Jesus would come, that Jesus would die, that Jesus would rise again, that you and I would have the opportunity to hear the gospel. And can I tell you this? It was also part of his plan that when you heard the gospel and I heard the gospel and we trusted Christ, that we would now go on and serve him. That was his plan. God has no desire for you and me just to kind of sit around and just, you know, wait for death. He has no desire for us just to not do nothing. His purpose and plan, Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He's got people he wants you to talk to. He's got prayers he wants you to pray. He's got money he wants you to give. He's got Bibles you, he wants you to help facilitate in getting them printed. He has people he wants you to open your mouth and share the gospel with. He already has that all set up. Are we willing to do it? Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're reminded that it's our gospel. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you know this verse well. Luke records this before Jesus goes to heaven. He, Luke says, here's what Jesus says. You shall receive power. I need power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Remember, Jesus said, I always keep my promises, and when I'm leaving, you're not going to be alone. I'm going to bring you a comforter, the Holy Spirit of God, and he'll abide with you, not come and go, not here one day and leave. He'll abide with you forever. You get him on salvation. And by the way, how do I know I got him? Because I, I, I roll around. I roll around on the floor. I start speaking in a language that nobody understands. That's how I know I got the Spirit. That, that, that's, that's contrary to what the Bible teaches. The Bible says you'll know that you have the Spirit because you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the world. You want to know if somebody's a true believer and the Spirit of God is inside of them? Are they out there sharing their faith with other people? If you're afraid to do that and won't do that, we're all afraid, but you're unwilling, or I'm unwilling to follow through. Why? Because when I know what a great message it, it is and how it changed my heart. 
how can I not want to share that with people? And you'll go be witnesses in Jerusalem, right in your city. Here's the reality. <clears throat> There's no way I'll ever go to Africa if I'm not willing to talk to my neighbors here in New York. That's true. So that's where it starts right here. I had a, <clears throat> a missions professor in college. He was in his 80s. He was born in northwest China. His mom and dad were missionaries to tribal groups way up in the mountains on the Tibet-Nepalese-Chinese border. And he grew up there for 18, 19 years of his life. When he got to the college age, he flew to the States, went to Bible college, and he met a young lady, and they got married. But they knew they were to be missionaries. But they didn't go back to that area of China. They spent 30 years in the Sahara Desert in northern Africa. And they traveled with nomad tribes all across that desert, hundreds of thousands of miles in 30 years, sharing the gospel with them. By the time he's in his 80s, his vision was almost gone, but he had something to offer. And man, what a wealth of knowledge. And I remember I had to take a missions class, so I sat in there with him, <clears throat> and a bunch of us were there, and he was just telling us how God did amazing things. And I remember him saying, look, God does not ask all of us to move to the Sahara Desert in Africa. But we should all be willing to move if he did ask. And that's a powerful question. Are you willing to do what God has asked you or would ask you to do? For many of us, it's like, God, I'll do this, but don't ask me to do anything. It's conditional. Aren't you glad that our salvation isn't full of all these conditions. Jesus said, I'll save you as long as you go to church 45 weeks a year. As long as you don't do this and don't do that. And now he says, all I'm asking is that you just say, here am I. I gave you my life. Give me yours. You know where it starts? Right here. If I won't talk to my neighbor or I won't talk to the, the person who may be across the street, I'm ashamed to do that. That's where it needs to start. And notice he tells these guys, look, you, you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem. That's your hometown right here. But it, it's not just here. Judea, that, that spreads out. The, maybe that's going from Queens to the city. Or maybe that's going then to Samaria. That's your, 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 your state. How many of you think New York State needs Jesus? You know what? To the uttermost part of the world. We have the responsibility to do something to help get the gospel around the world. It is our responsibility. It's not somebody else's. Who, who else would do that? We, we're the ones that know Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. So am I praying for people who are going? Hey, I find out somebody's going. Let me help. Let me do as much as I possibly can to help them. Maybe I'm going to take a trip. Hey, they're going to Guyana. I want to go down there and just help. Maybe I can't live there 52 weeks out of the year, but I can go down there for a week, and I'm going to try to help. What is it that I can do to get the gospel out around the world? By the way, you read in Acts 2, 3,000 people were saved. Acts 4, another 5,000 were saved. So this church grew and grew. But here's their problem. They really liked it. They were doing great, and they just stayed in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, there's a whole big world out there. I, I told you to go. And they didn't do it. So God helped them out a little bit. He sent Roman authorities to start persecuting the church. And when persecution came, all of a sudden, hey, honey, let's get out of here. And they packed their bags and they left. And they went 30 miles down the road or they went 100 miles to another place or they went into other regions. And when they did, they took their faith with them and they began to talk about Christ and the gospel spread. That's what we're to do. Look, it's imperative because that we, sh that we go and share the gospel because it's God's plan. Also to extinguish false teaching. And let me leave you to these thoughts. Notice verse 16. So Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he makes this statement. For he, in Mark 16 and verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now Jesus is fairly clear here about what is in necessary to be saved. Believing on him. 
And then if we do what we're supposed to do when we read the Bible, God said line upon line, precept on precept, you look at all the other scriptures and what's the Bible say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now, people will take this passage out of context, and they'll say, wait, he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, right? And most mainline religions, baptism's in there somewhere, and for most of them, baptism is a crucial part of maybe uh, ascending or uh, getting your salvation or making God happy, and it's one of your steps of salvation, where the Bible said baptism has nothing to do with you being saved. You know, there's a lot of false teaching out there. So, for instance, this verse, let's just, what's the one common denominator? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. The common denominator is the belief. Does that make sense? It's important to be baptized, but baptism shows the decision you made to believe. Think of it this way. Let's say it this way. <clears throat> Because if, if you read it this way, as some do, see, and I've, people will say, look, you got to believe and be baptized to go to heaven, but apparently you just, all you have to do is not believe and you'll go to hell. That's, that's not very consistent. Read it this way. He that getteth on the bus and that sitteth down on the bus will arrive at church. But he that getteth not on the bus shall not get to church. So, What's important, sitting on the bus or getting on the bus? And what Jesus is saying, you have to believe to be saved. Baptism shows that you made that decision. And by the way, if you've made that decision to trust Christ, but well, I don't want to get baptized. Don't talk to me about getting baptized. I don't want to, maybe you need to check. Because why would you be ashamed of the decision you made to trust Christ and to identify with him? Can I tell you that they estimate out of the 8.1 billion people that are on the surface of the planet today that there are 4,000 known world religions. Now, there are probably more than that, but these are just known or documented by somebody, 4,000. In New York City alone, we have a population of residents of 8.8 .8 million people. In our city alone, just up until a few years ago, we had over 100 uh, international religions had their headquarters in New York City. There are a lot of people who do not know the truth, that they're trusting and believing in all kinds of things, and for many of them, they have no uh, understanding or concept of really who Jesus truly is and what he has done for them. 25% of New York City residents will uh, uh, affirm that they are religiously unaffiliated that they have no religious connection at all. And what are we to do? We're to tell them about Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, if our gospel's hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And what do we know, verse 4? These lost people have the God of this world blinding their minds so that they believe not. But that's what we've talked about the last five weeks, that sometimes, sadly, even as Christians, we allow Satan to come back and just blind us with all of our bills and problems and money and the rat race of life, and we miss what God's trying to do. But people that don't even know the Lord, Satan's working hard, and he keeps them blinded that, hey, this will make you happy, this will ease the pain, this is the answer you need, this, if you just had this, you'll be fine, and he blinds them lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ would shine unto them. Even if they realize I need something, then here comes false religion here. And believe this and follow this and they're all hopeless. So you and I, it's imperative that we go out and we, we share the truth. It was Jesus that said the truth is what makes a person free. And I get it. People say, well, if somebody really wants to know, they can just go on the internet. But they can find our church somewhere and they'll figure it out. You, you understand that, and yes, God is gracious and if God's people won't do what they're supposed to do. God often has to supernaturally step in and, and make a way. But how much better is it if we say, hey, well, let's walk with you and we'll walk down this road of truth and share it with you so that you can avoid a whole bunch of heartache and avoid a whole bunch of confusion in your life. We need to be out there proclaiming the truth to help fight against false teaching and then we should do it so that we can experience God's blessing.
He told these people, these disciples, if you go, I will help you. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 is really kind of our church verse where Jesus said it this way, go and teach all nations. And once they hear, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then teach them to observe, disciple them, make them disciples of me like I have commanded. And if you do that, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, so be it. Hey, he never leaves us or he never forsakes us. We know that. But if we want God's hand of blessing on us personally and we want God's hand of blessing on us uh, as, uh, corporately as a church, there is nothing that God gets behind more than when his people say, God, we're here to represent you and we're going to talk to you, to everybody we possibly can, and we're going to do everything that we possibly can to get your message out to the world. And God says, I'm right there with you. Notice in verse 20, when these disciples went forth and preached everywhere, in verse 20, Mark 6, 15, the Bible said that the Lord worked with them. How many of you rather have God working with you than against you? Because if God be for us, he worked with them, he partnered with them, he helped them, and he confirmed, he showed them. See, because people started getting saved, people started making decisions, people started following the Lord, and they saw this thing works. There's product. Our job is not to force people, coerce people, make people. Our job is to be a witness, just to tell people, let me tell you what Jesus has done. And if we'll do that and stand back, you know what God does? He takes that, and he starts working in people. But if we won't do that, we miss the blessing. We get caught up in a whole lot of things in this life that really don't matter. What are we doing to advance the kingdom of God? What are we doing to help get the gospel around the world? What are we doing right here in our own neighborhood? Are we praying for people? Grab a prayer card out there and just start praying for missionaries. Am I giving to missions? Hey, you know what? I don't, I don't need to go by the coffee shop this week. I'm, I'm going to put some money in for missionaries. So I know that every person that Ray Hoover shares the gospel with, I have a part in that. Every church they start in Ethiopia, I get a, I get, I'm a part of that. And I'll meet all those people in heaven one day. Won't that be awesome? People say, what am I going to do for all eternity? Well, if you're doing what you should be doing, part of the time you'll be meeting people that you had a part in planting and watering and planting and watering. And you're going to be sharing with people who had a part in planting and watering in your life. What a great place it will be. Are we doing what we should be doing? Am I giving? Am I praying? Am I going? Take some tracks with you. But let's do something. Why? Because it's a great suggestion. No, because it's a command. And if you want God to work with you, be a part of something that matters the whole world to him, and that's mission. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Heads are bowed in a moment. We'll close out, but before we do, I just want to give us an opportunity to kind of search our heart for a moment. What are you doing? What am I doing to help the gospel go around the world? Are we doing something? You say, I never really thought about it. Or maybe, hey, you know, I, I kind of thought that was not my problem. Well, it is. Now, I get it. We can't all fly on planes and go back and forth to countries, and we can't be in two places at once. And if we all packed up and moved, who, who's going to be here in New York City? So I understand that. But am I open? God, what is it you want me to do? What can I do? Maybe today it just begins with, I haven't even ever thought about it. But today I'm thinking about it. Maybe it's, you know what, I can go on some trips sometime. We have folks in our church that regularly do that. That go back. He's not in this service. He was here early. Brother Jose is from the Dominican. And for years he goes back four or five times a, a, a year to the Dominican Republic taking clothes, taking food, and taking gospel tracts. Personally, he's helping to build churches down there, supporting pastors so that the gospel can go forth. 
Maybe I can go visit one of our missionaries. Maybe I can go on a trip with the church. Hey, you know what? I'm really not doing it. Maybe I can just start praying for our missionaries. We have a missionary every week. We have prayer cards. I can take one of those and every day pray for some of our missionaries. You know how valuable that is? Because you, you can't go to them, but God's there. Maybe I can give. Some of these missionaries have had to come back to the United States because they can't survive. They have to eat. They're not living lavish lifestyles. So many of them are just in very simple places. But it takes finances. And there's no worse call that I get from a missionary than when they're brokenhearted and say, you know, we have to come back. We just can't afford to stay there anymore. But we could help. We could pay to print Bibles. We can pay to help put up concrete blocks to build churches. Are you doing something? And what about here? I'm really not going to help around the world if I'm not even concerned about what's going on in my own backyard. What family members, what friends, what co-workers, what people, maybe their faces are flashing in your mind today. Have you talked to them about Jesus? Why not? Are you praying for them every day? Are you taking gospel tracts with you and sharing them? Well, that's somebody else's job. It's not, really. It's our job. If we'll do that, God will be with us. God will help us. God will encourage us, and we'll see the fruit. Maybe you're here today, and you would just say, Hey, Pastor, you're talking about this gospel. I, I don't even know that I've received this wonderful salvation. Matter of fact, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven if something happened to me, but I want to go to heaven one day. Jesus died for you. Today could be the day when you say, Jesus, please save me. I wonder if there's anybody here and you would say, that's really my story. I, I want Jesus to save me. I've never made that decision. Pray for me. Is there somebody like that? Just slip a hand up so I can pray for you. Anybody? Pray for me today. You know, right there where you sit, you can just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying and being buried and rising again for me. Save me. If you'd like to talk with somebody, I'll be here in a moment. We're going to stand and have an invitation. If you need to come and pray, talk to somebody. We have men, we have ladies that will be glad to talk with you today, and you can make that decision in your life. If God's speaking to you, would you at least be willing to say, Lord, here I am, and I just want to do whatever it is you want me to do to get the gospel out. I know it's a big statement. Are you willing to make that statement? Let's stand for prayer. Lord, I pray that you would help us today to be willing to go out of our comfort zone, to do what we are not doing, to do more than what we are doing. So Lord, work in our hearts today, we pray in your name. Heads are bowed as Adam just plays. We'll just take a moment of quiet reflection, search your heart. If you need to come and pray, you need to talk with somebody here. If you have questions, Ryan's here, I'm here. We'll have folks that'll be glad to talk with you. Don't pass up the opportunity. Come today. Christians, would you pray? Search your heart. God, what am I doing? What can I do more? If you don't know Christ today, we'd love for you to make that decision. We'd love to talk with you about it. Would you come? Just say, hey, I got questions about this This. The salvation. It would be our privilege to share the truth with you today. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I pray that we don't leave here today and just think, uh, truth is, when we walk out the doors today, we're back in a mission field. 8.8 .8 million people work begins tomorrow, that will go up exponentially. Many, many who do not know you. So, Lord, I pray that we'll understand we live in a mission field. But Lord, I pray over this day and the next few weeks that we'll consider, put on our heart things that we can do to help our missionaries, to do more to get the gospel around the world. We pray. Lord, let us be a church 
we're not known for anything else, let us be known for being a church who loves people, not just here, but around the world. And we, we're committed to doing all that we can to share the gospel of Christ with them. So, Lord, I, I thank you for this day. I thank you we could worship you. We sing about your salvation. We sing about your blood shed for us. We sing about the hope that we have that only comes from you. Everybody in this world deserves to hear that message at least once. And Lord, I pray that we'll do everything that we possibly can to share it. And so, Lord, as we dismiss today, I know there are meetings coming up and services tonight and a lot of events. I, I just pray you'll bless, superintend over all those things. And Lord, I pray you'll bless our missions festival next week. It'll be a great time. Folks will enjoy kind of seeing uh, tables and displays. Uh, others would participate. So we have missionaries come, Lord. Let it just be a great time and stir our hearts, Lord, from the smallest of us, our children, to the oldest of us. Lord, help us to do something, we pray. So, Lord, we're asking that you send us with your blessing. Thank you for your love for us. We love you, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. amen. I want to thank you for being here today. Remember your offering on your way out. If you're visiting, please stop at the Welcome Center. Teen workers meeting here, nursery workers meeting downstairs, okay? God bless you. If you'd like to talk, I'll be around for a while.